Book Two, Chapter Nine of The Wanderer's Necklace by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine, The Hall of the Pit. The days and the nights went by, but which was day and which was night I knew not, save for the visits of the jailers with my meals. I who was blind, I who should never see the light again. At first I suffered much, but by degrees the pain died away. Also a physician came to tend my hurts, a skilful man, Soon I discovered, however, that he had another object. He pitied my state so much, indeed, he said, that he offered to supply me with a drug that, if I were willing to take it, would make an end of me painlessly. Now I understood at once that Irene desired my death, and, fearing to cause it, set the means of self-murder within my reach. I thanked the man and begged him to give me the drug, which he did whereon I hid it away in my garments. When it was seen that I still lived, although I had asked for the medicine, I think that Irene believed this was because it had failed to work, or that such a means of death did not please me. So she found another. One evening, when a jailer brought my supper, he pressed something heavy into my hand, which I felt to be a sword. "'What weapon is this?' i asked and why do you give it to me it is your own sword answered the man which i was commanded to return to you i know no more then he went away leaving the sword with me i drew the familiar blade from its sheath the red blade that the wanderer had worn and touching its keen edge with my fingers wept from my blinded eyes to think that never again could I hold it aloft in war, or see the light flash from it as I smote? Yet I wept in my weakness, till I remembered that I had no longer any wish to be the death of men. So I sheathed the good sword and hid it beneath my mattress, lest some jailer should steal it, which, as I could not see him, he might do easily. Also I desired to put away temptation." I think that this hour, after the bringing of the sword, which stirred up so many memories, was the most fearful of all my hours, so fearful that, had it been prolonged, death would have come to me of its own accord. I had sunk to misery's lowest deep, who did not know that even then its tide was turning, who could not dream of all the blessed years that lay before me the years of love and of such peaceful joy as even the blind may win that night martina came martina who was hope's harbinger i heard the door of my prison open and close softly and sat still wondering whether the murderers had entered at last wondering too whether i should snatch the sword and strike blindly till i fell next i heard another sound that of a woman weeping yes and i felt my hand lifted and pressed to a woman's lips which kissed it again and yet again a thought struck me and i began to draw it back a soft voice spoke between its sobs have no fear olaf i am martina oh now i understand why yonder tigress sent me on that distant mission how did you come here martina i asked I still have the signet, Olaf, which Irene, who begins to mistrust me, forgets. Only this morning I learned the truth on my return to the palace, yet I have not been idle. Within an hour, Jode and the Northmen knew it also. Within three, they had blinded every hostage whom they held. I and caught two of the brutes who did the deed on you and crucified them upon their barrack walls. Oh, Martina, I broke in. I did not desire that others who are innocent should share my woes. Nor did I, Olaf, but these Northmen are ill to play with. Moreover, in a sense, it was needful. You do not know what I have learned, that tomorrow Irene proposed to slit your tongue also because you can tell too much, 
and afterwards to cut off your right hand lest you who are learned should write down what you know i told the northmen never mind how they sent a herald a greek whom they had captured and covering him with arrows made him call out that if your tongue was slit they would know of it and slit the tongues of all the hostages also and that if your hand was cut off they could cut off their hands and take another vengeance which for the present they keep secret at least they are faithful i said but oh tell me martina what of heliodore this she whispered into my ear heliodore and her father sailed an hour after sunset and are now safe upon the sea bound for egypt then i was right when irene told me that she was dead she lied ay if she said that she lied though thrice has she striven to murder her i have no time to tell you how but was always baffled by those who watched yet she might have succeeded at last so although heliodore fought against it it was best that she should go those who are parted may meet again but how can we meet one who is dead until we too are dead how did she go smuggled from the city disguised as a boy attending on a priest and that priest her father shorn of his beard and tonsured the bishop barnabas passed them out in his following then blessings on the bishop barnabas i said ay blessings on him since without his help it could never have been done the secret agents at the port stared hard at those two although the good bishop vouched for them and gave their names and offices still when they saw some rough-looking fellows dressed like sailors approach playing with the handles of their knives the agents thought well to ask no more questions moreover now that the ship is sailed for their own sakes they'll swear that no such priest and boy went aboard of her so your heliodore is away unharmed as is her father though his mission has come to naught still his life is left in him for which he may be thankful who on such a business should have brought no woman if he had come alone olaf your eyes would have been left to you and set by now upon the orb of empire that your hand had grasped yet i am glad that he did not come alone martina truly you have a high and faithful heart and that woman should be honoured whom you love what is the secret there must be more in it than the mere desire for a woman's beauty though i know at times this can make men mad in such a business the soul must play its part i think so martina indeed i believe so since otherwise we suffer much in vain now tell me how and when do i die i hope you will not die at all olaf certain plans are laid which even here i dare not whisper to-morrow i hear they will lead you again before the judges who by irene's clemency will change your sentence to one of banishment with secret orders to kill you on the voyage but you will never make that voyage other schemes are afoot you'll learn of them afterwards yet martina if you know these plots the augusta knows them also since you and she are one when those dagger points were thrust into your eyes olaf they cut the thread that bound us and now irene and i are more far apart than hell and heaven i tell you that for your sake i hate her and work her downfall am i not your godmother olaf then again she kissed my hand and presently was gone on the following morning as i supposed it to be my jailers came and said to me that i must appear before the judges to hear some revision of my sentence they dressed me in my soldier's gear and even allowed me to gird my sword about me knowing doubtless that save to himself a blind man could do no mischief with a sword then they led me i know not whither by passages which turned now here now there at length we entered some place for doors were closed behind us this is the hall of judgment said one of them but the judges have not yet come it is a great room and bare there is nothing in it against which you can hurt yourself 
therefore if it pleases you after being crammed so long in that narrow cell you may walk to and fro keeping your hands in front of you so that you will know when you touch the further wall and must turn i thanked them and glad enough to avail myself of this grace for my limbs were stiff with want of exercise began to walk joyfully i thought that the room must be one of those numberless apartments which opened on to the terrace since distinctly i could hear the wash of the sea coming from far beneath doubtless through the open window places forward i stepped boldly but at a certain point in my march this curious thing happened a hand seemed to seize my own and draw me to the left wondering i followed the guidance of the hand which presently left hold of mine thereon i continued my march and as i did so thought that i heard another sound like to that of a suppressed murmur of human voices twenty steps more and i reached the end of the chamber for my outstretched fingers touched its marble wall i turned and marched back and lo at the twentieth step that hand took mine again and led me to the right whereon once more the murmur of voices reached me thrice this happened and every time the murmur grew more loud indeed i thought i heard one say the man's not blind at all and another some spirit guides him as i made my fourth journey i caught the sound of a distant tumult the shouts of war the screams of agony and above them all the well-remembered cry of valhalla valhalla victory or valhalla i halted where i was and felt the blood rush into my wasted cheeks the northmen my northmen were in the palace it was at this that martina had hinted yet in so vast a place what chance was there that they would ever find me and how being blind could i find them well at least my voice was left to me and i would lift it so with all my strength i cried aloud olaf redsword is here to olaf men of the north thrice i cried i heard folk running not to me but from me doubtless those whose whispers had reached my ears i thought of trying to follow them but the soft and gentle hand which was like to that of a woman once more clasped mine and held me where i was suffering me to move no single inch so there i stood even after the hand had loosed me again for it seemed to me that there was something most strange in this business presently another sound arose the sound of the northmen pouring towards the hall for feet clanged louder and louder down the marble corridors more they had met those who were running from the hall for now these fled back before them they were in the hall for a cry of horror mingled with rage broke from their lips tis olaf said one olaf blinded and by thor see where he stands then jode's voice roared out move not olaf move not or you die another voice that of martina broke in silence you fool or you'll frighten him and make him fall silence all and leave him to me then quiet fell upon the place it seemed that even the pursued grew quiet and i heard the rustle of a woman's dress drawing towards me next instant a soft hand took my own just such a hand as not long ago had seemed to guide and hold me and martina's voice said follow where i lead olaf so i followed eight or ten paces then martina threw her arms about me and burst into wild laughter someone caught her away next moment two hair-clad lips kissed me on the brow and the mighty voice of jode shouted thanks be to all the gods dwell they in the north or in the south we have saved you know you where you stood olaf on the brink of a pit the very brink and beneath is a fall of a hundred feet to where the waters of the bosphorus wash among the rocks oh understand this pretty grecian game 
they good christian folk would not have your blood upon their souls and therefore they caused you to walk to your own death well they shall be dosed with the draught they brewed bring them hither comrades bring them one by one these devils who could sit to watch a blind man walk to his doom to make their sport ah whom have we here why by thor tis the lawyer knave he who was president of the court that tried you and was angry because you did not salute him well lawyer the wheel has gone round we northmen are in possession of the palace and the armenian legions are gathered at its gates and do but wait for constantine the emperor to enter and take the empire and its crown they'll be here anon lawyer but you understand having a certain life to save for word had been brought to us of your pretty doings that we were forced to strike before the signal and struck not in vain now we'll fill in the tedious time with a trial of our own see here i am president of the court seated in this fine chair and these six to right and left are my companion judges while you seven who were judges are now prisoners you know the crime with which you are charged so there's no need to set it out your defence lawyer and be swift with it oh sir said the man in a trembling voice what we did to the general olaf we were ordered to do by one who may not be named you'd best find the name lawyer for were it that of a god we northmen would hear it well then by the augusta herself she wished the death of the noble michael or olaf but having become superstitious about the matter would not have his blood directly on her hands therefore she bethought her of this plan he was ordered to be brought into the place you see which is known as the hall of the pit that in old days was used by certain bloody-minded emperors to rid them of their enemies the central pavement swings upon a hinge at a touch it opens and he who has thought it sound and walked thereon when darkness comes is lost since he falls upon the rocks far below and at high tide the water takes him yes yes we understand the game lawyer for there yawns the open pit but have you aught more to say nothing sir nothing save that we only did what we were driven to do moreover no harm has come of it since whenever the noble general came to the edge of the open pit although he was blind he halted and went off to right or left as though someone drew him out of danger well then cruel and unjust judges who could gather to mock at the murder of a blinded man that you had trapped to his doom sir broke in one of them it was not we who tried to trap him it was those jailers who stand there they told the general that he might exercise himself by walking up and down the hall is that true olaf asked jode yes i answered it is true that the two jailers who brought me here did tell me this though whether those men are present i cannot say very good said jode add them to the other prisoners who by their own showing heard them set the snare and did not warn the victim now murderers all this is the sentence of the court upon you that you salute the general olaf and confess your wickedness to him so they saluted me kneeling and kissing my feet and one and all made confession of their crime enough i said i pardon them who are but tools pray to god that he may do as much you may pardon here olaf said jode and your god may pardon hereafter but we the northmen do not pardon blindfold those men and bind their arms now went on jode after a pause their turn has come to show us sport run friends run for swords are behind you can you not feel them the rest may be guessed within a few minutes the seven judges and the two jailers had vanished from the world no hand came to save them from the cruel rocks and the waters that seethed a hundred feet below that dreadful chamber 
this fantastic savage vengeance was a thing dreadful to hear what it must have been to see i can only guess i know that i wished i might have fled from it and that i pleaded with jode for mercy on these men but neither he nor his companions would listen to me what mercy had they on you he cried let them drink from their own cup let them drink from their own cup roared his companions and then broke into a roar of laughter as one of the false judges feeling space before him leapt leapt short and with a shriek departed for ever it was over i heard someone enter the hall and whisper in jode's ear heard his answer also let her be brought hither he said for the rest bid the captains hold staracious and the others fast if there is any sign of stir against us cut their throats advising them that this will be done should they allow trouble to arise do not fire the palace unless i give the word for it would be a pity to burn so fine a building it is those who dwell in it who should be burned but doubtless constantine will see to that collect the richest of the booty that which is most portable and let it be carried to our quarters in the baggage carts see that these things are done quickly before the armenians get their hands into the bag i'll be with you soon but if the emperor constantine should arrive first tell him that all has gone well better than he hoped indeed and pray him to come hither where we may take counsel the messenger went jode and some of the northmen began to consult together and martina led me aside tell me what has chanced martina i asked for i am bewildered a revolution that is all olaf jode and the northmen are the point of the spear its handle is constantine and the hands that hold it are the armenians it has been very well done some of the guards who remained were bribed others frightened away only a few fought and of them the northmen made short work irene and her ministers were fooled they thought the blow would not fall for a week or more if at all since the empress believed that she had appeased constantine by her promises i'll tell you more later how did you find me martina and in time oh olaf it is a terrible story almost i swoon again to think of it it was thus irene discovered that i had visited you in your cell she grew suspicious of me this morning i was seized and ordered to surrender the signet but first i had heard that they planned your death to-day not a sentence of banishment or murder afar off as i told you my last act before i was taken was to dispatch a trusted messenger to jode and the northmen telling them that if they would save you alive they must strike at once and not to-night as had been arranged within thirty seconds after he had left my side the eunuchs had me and took me to my chamber where they barred me in a while later the augusta came raging like a lioness she accused me of treachery and when i denied it struck me in the face look here are the marks of the jewels on her hands oh alas what said i you cannot see she had learned that the lady heliodore had escaped her and that i had some hand in her escape she vowed that i your godmother was your lover and as this is a crime against the church promised me that after other sufferings i should be burned alive in the hippodrome before all the people lastly she said this know that your olaf of whom you are so fond dies within an hour and thus he will be taken to the hall of the pit and there given leave to walk till the judges come being blind you may guess where he will walk before this door is unlocked again i tell you he'll be but a heap of splintered bones ay you may start and weep but save your tears for yourself and she called me a foul name i have got you fast at length you night prowling cat and god himself cannot give you strength to stretch out your hand and guide this accursed olaf from the edge of the pit of death 
"'God alone knows what he can do, Augusta,' I answered, "'for the words seemed to be put into my lips. "'Then she cursed and struck me again, "'and so left me barred in my chamber. "'When she had gone, I flung myself upon my knees "'and prayed to God to save you. "'Olaf, since I was helpless, "'prayed as I had never prayed before. "'Praying thus, I think that I fell into a swoon.' for my agony was more than I could bear, and in the swoon I dreamed. I dreamed that I stood in this place, where till now I have never been before. I saw the judges, the jailers, and a few others watching from that gallery. I saw you walk along the hall towards the great open pit. Then I seemed to glide to you and take your hand and guide you round the pit. And, Olaf, this happened thrice. Afterwards came a tumult, while you were on the very edge of the pit, and I held you not suffering you to stir. Then in rushed the Northmen and I with them. Yes, standing there with you upon the edge of the pit, I saw myself and the Northmen rush into the hall. Martina, I whispered, a hand that seemed to be a woman's did guide me thrice round the edge of the pit and did hold me almost until you and the Northmen rushed in. Oh, God is great, she gasped. God is very great, and to him I give thanks. But hearken to the end of the tale. I awoke from my swoon and heard a noise without, and above it the Northmen's cry of victory. They had scaled the palace walls or broken in the gates, as yet I know not which. They were on the terrace, driving the Greek guards before them. I ran to the window place, and there below me saw Jode. I screamed till he heard me. "'Save me, if you would save Olaf!' I cried. "'I am prisoned here!' They brought one of their scaling ladders and drew me through the window. I told them all I knew. They caught a palace eunuch and beat him till he promised to lead us to this hall. He led but in the labyrinth of passages fell down senseless, for they had struck him too hard. We knew not which way to turn, till suddenly we heard your voice and ran towards it. That is all the story, Olaf. End of chapter 9book two, chapter ten of the Wanderer's Necklace by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Olaf Gives Judgment As Martina finished speaking, I heard the sound of tramping guards and of a woman's dress upon the pavement. Then a voice, that of Irene, spoke, and though her words were quiet, I caught them in the tremble of smothered rage. "'Be pleased to tell me, Captain Jode,' she said. "'What is happening in my palace, "'and why I, the Empress, am hailed from my apartment hither "'by soldiers under your command?' "'Lady,' answered Jode, "'you are mistaken. "'Yesterday you were an Empress. "'Today you are, well, whatever your son the Emperor "'chooses to name you.' As to what has been and is happening in this palace, I scarcely know where to begin the tale. First of all, your general and chamberlain Olaf, in case you should not recognize him, I mean that blind man who stands yonder, was being tricked to death by certain servants of yours who called themselves judges and who stated that they were acting by your orders. "'Confront me with them,' said Irene, "'that I may prove to you that they lie.' "'Certainly. "'Ho, oh, you bring the lady Irene here. "'Now hold her over that hole. "'Nay, struggle not, lady, "'lest you should slip from their hands. "'Look down steadily, "'and you will see by the light "'that flows in from the cave beneath "'certain heaps lying on the rocks.' round which the rising waters seethe. There are your judges whom you say you wish to meet. If you desire to ask them any questions, 
we can satisfy your will nay why should you turn pale at the mere sight of the place that you thought good enough to be the bed of a faithful soldier of your own one high in your service whom it has pleased you to blind why did it please you to blind him lady who are you that dare to ask me questions she replied gathering up her courage i tell you lady now that the general olaf yonder is blinded i am the officer in command of the northmen who until you tried to murder the said general olaf a while ago were your faithful guard i am also as it chances the officer in command of this palace which we took this morning by assault and by arrangement with most of your greek soldiers having learned from your confidential lady martina of the vile deed you were about to work on the general olaf so it was you who betrayed me martina gasped irene and i had you in my power oh i had you in my power i did not betray you augusta i saved my godson yonder from torture and butchery as by my oath i was bound to do answered martina have done with this talk of betrayals went on jode for who can betray a devil now lady with your state quarrels we have nothing to do you can settle them presently with your son that is if you still live but with this matter of olaf we have much to do and we will settle at once the first part of the business we all know so let us get to the next by whose order were you blinded general olaf by that of the augusta i answered for what reason general olaf for one that i will not state i answered good you were blinded by the augusta for a reason you will not state but which is well known to all of us now we have a law in the north which says an eye should be given for an eye and a life for a life would it not then be right comrades that this woman should be blinded also what screamed irene blinded blinded i the empress tell me lady are the eyes of one who was an empress different from other eyes why should you complain of that darkness into which you were so ready to plunge one better than yourself still olaf shall judge is it your will general that we blind this woman who put out your eyes and afterwards tried to murder you now i felt that all in that place were watching me and hanging on the words that i should speak so intently that they never heard others entering it as i did for a while i paused for why should not irene suffer a little of that agony of suspense which she had inflicted on me and others. Then I said, See what I have lost, friends, through no grave fault of my own. I was in the way of greatness. I was a soldier whom you trusted and liked well, one of unstained honour and of unstained name. Also I loved a woman, by whom I was beloved and whom I hoped to make my wife. And now what am I? My trade is gone, for how can a maimed man lead in war, or even do the meanest service of the camp? The rest of my days, should any be granted to me, must be spent in darkness blacker than that of midnight. I must live on charity, when the little store I have is spent, for I have taken no bribe and heaped up no riches. How can I earn a living? The woman whom I love has been carried away, after this empress tried thrice to murder her. Whether I shall ever find her again in this world I know not, for she has gone to a far country that is full of enemies to Christian men. Nor do I know whether she would be willing to take one who is blind and beggared for a husband, though I think this may be so. Shame on her if she does not, muttered Martina as I paused. Well, friends, 
"'That is my case,' I went on. "'Let the Augusta deny it, if she can.' "'Speak, lady, do you deny it?' said Jode. "'I do not deny that this man was blinded by my order "'in payment of crimes for which he might well have suffered death,' "'answered Irene. "'But I do deny that I commanded him to be trapped in yonder pit. "'If those dead men said so, then they lied.' "'And if the Lady Martina says so, what then?' asked Jode. "'Then she lies also,' answered the Empress sullenly. "'Be it so,' replied Jode. "'Yet it is strange that, acting on this lie of the Lady Martina's, "'we found the General Olaf upon the very edge of yonder hole. "'Yes, with not the breadth of a barleycorn between him and death now general both parties have been heard and you shall pass sentence if you say that yonder woman is to be blinded this moment she looks her last upon the light if you say that she is to die this moment she bids farewell to life again i thought a while it came into my mind that irene who had fallen from power might rise once more and bring fresh evil upon heliodore now she was in my hand but if i opened that hand and let her free someone moved towards me and i heard irene's voice whispering in my ear olaf she said if i sinned against you it was because i loved you would you be avenged upon one who has burned her soul with so much evil because she loved too well oh if so you are no longer olaf for christ's sake have pity on me since i am not fit to meet him give me time to repent nay hear me out let not those men drag me away as they threaten to do i am fallen now but who knows i may grow great again indeed i think i shall then olaf may my soul shrivel everlastingly in hell if i try to harm you or the egyptian more jesus be my witness that i ask no lesser doom upon my head keep the men back martina for what i swear to him and the Egyptian I swear to you as well. Moreover, Olaf, I have great wealth. You spoke of poverty. It shall be far from you. Martina knows where my gold is hid, and she still holds my keys. Let her take it. I say, leave me alone, but one word more. If ever it is in my power, I'll forget everything, and advance you all to great honor. Your brain is not blinded, Olaf. You can still rule... I swear, I swear, I swear upon the holy blood. Ah, now drag me away, if you will, I have spoken. Then perchance, lady, you will allow Olaf to speak, since we, who have much to do, must finish this business quickly, before the emperor comes with the Armenians, said Jode. Captain Jode and his comrades, I said. The Empress Irene has been pleased to make certain solemn vows to me, which perchance some of you may have overheard. At least God heard them, and whether she keeps them or no, is a matter between her and the God in whom we both believe. Therefore I set these vows aside. They draw me neither one way nor the other. Now you have made me judge in my own matter, and have promised to abide by my judgment, which you will do hear it then and let it be remembered for long i have been the augustus officer and of late her general and chamberlain as such i have bound myself by great oaths to protect her from harm in all cases and those oaths heretofore i have kept when i might have broken them and not been blamed by men whatever has chanced it seems that she is still empress, and I am still her officer, seeing that my sword has been returned to me, although it is true she sent it that I might use it on myself. It pleased the empress to put out my eyes. Under our soldier's law, the monarch who rules the empire has the right to put out the eyes of an officer who has lifted sword against her forces, or even to kill him. Whether this is done justly or unjustly again is a matter between the monarch and God above, to whom answer must be made at last. 
therefore it would seem that i have no right to pronounce any sentence against the augusta irene and whatever may have been my private wrongs i pronounce none yet as i am still your general until another is named i order you to free the augusta irene and to work no vengeance on her person for aught that may have befallen me at her hands were her deeds just or unjust when i had finished speaking in the silence that followed i heard irene utter something that was half a sob and half a gasp of wonderment then above the murmuring of the northmen to whom this reed was strange rose the great voice of jode general olaf he said while you were talking it came into my mind that one of those knife points which pierced your eyes had pricked the brain behind them but when you had finished talking it came into my mind that you are a great man who putting aside your private rights and wrongs and the glory of revenge which lay to your hand have taught us soldiers a lesson in duty which i at least never shall forget general if as i trust we are together in the future as in the past i shall ask you to instruct me in this christian faith of yours which can make a man not only forgive but hide his forgiveness under the mask of duty for that as we know well is what you have done general your order shall be obeyed be she empress or nothing this lady's person is safe from us more we will protect her to the best of our power as you did in the battle of the garden yet i tell her to her face that had it not been for those orders had you for example said that you left judgment to us she who has spoilt such a man should have died a death of shame i heard a sound as of a woman throwing herself upon her knees before me I heard Irene's voice whisper through her tears. Olaf, Olaf, for the second time in my life you make me feel ashamed. Oh, if only you could have loved me, then I should have grown good like you. There was a stir of feet and another voice spoke, a voice that should have been clear and youthful, but sounded as though it were thick with wine. It did not need Martina's whisper to tell me that it was that of Constantine. "'Greetings, friends,' he said, and at once there came a rattle of saluting swords and an answering cry of, "'Greetings, Augustus!' "'You struck before the time,' went on the thick, boyish voice. "'Yet, as things seem to have gone rather well for us, I cannot blame you.' especially as i see that you hold fast her who has usurped my birthright now i heard irene turn with a swift and furious movement your birthright boy she cried what birthright have you save that which my body gave i thought that my father had more to do with this matter of imperial right than the grecian girl whom it pleased him to marry for her fair face answered constantine insolently adding learn your station mother learn that you are but the lamp which once held the holy oil and that lamps can be shattered ay she answered and oil can be spilt for the dogs to lap if their gorge does not rise at such rancid stuff the holy oil forsooth nay the sour dregs of wine jars the outscourings of the stews the filth of the stables of such is the holy oil that burns in constantine the drunkard and the liar it would seem that before this torrent of coarse invective constantine quailed who at heart always feared his mother and i think never more so than when he appeared to triumph over her or perhaps he scorned to answer it at least addressing jode he said captain i and my officers standing yonder unseen 
have heard something of what passed in this place. By what warrant do you and your company take upon yourselves to pass judgment upon this mother of mine? That is the Emperor's right. By the warrant of capture, Augustus, answered Jode, we Northmen took the palace and opened the gates to you and your Armenians. Also we took her who ruled the palace, with whom we had a private score to settle that has to do with our general who stands yonder, blinded. Well, it is settled in his own fashion, and now we do not yield up this woman, our prisoner, save on your royal promise that no harm shall come to her in body. As for the rest, it is your business. Make a cook maid of her, if you will. Only then I think her tongue would clear the kitchen. But swear to keep her sound in life and limb, till hell calls her, since otherwise we must add her to our company, which will make no man merrier. No, answered Constantine. In a week she would corrupt you every one and breed a war. Well, he added with a boisterous laugh, I'm master now at last, and I'll swear by any saint that you may name, or all of them, no harm shall come to this empress, whose rule is done, and who, being without friends, need not be feared. Still, lest she should spawn more mischief or murder, she must be kept close till we and our counsellors decide where she shall dwell in future. Ho, guards, take my royal father's widow to the dower palace, and there watch her well. If she escapes, you shall die beneath the rods. Away with the snake before it begins to hiss again. I'll hiss no more, said Irene, as the soldiers formed up around her. Yet perchance, Constantine, you may live to find that the snake still has strength to strike and poison in its fangs, you and others. Do you come with me, Martina? Nay, lady, since here stands one whom God and you together have given me to guard. For his sake I would keep my life in me. And she touched me on the shoulder. That whelp who is called my son spoke truly when he said that the fallen have no friends, exclaimed Irene. Well, you should thank me, Martina, who made Olaf blind, since being without eyes, he cannot see how ugly is your face. In his darkness he may perchance mistake you for his beauteous Egyptian Heliodore, as I know you who love him madly would have him do. With this vile taunt she went. I think I am crazed, said the Emperor, as the doors swung to behind her. I should have struck that snake while the stick is in my hand. I tell you, I fear her fangs. Why, if she could, she'd make me as that poor man is, blind, or even butcher me. Well, she's my mother, and I've sworn, so there's an end. Now, you, Olaf, you are that same captain, are you not, who dashed the poisoned fig from my lips? that this tender mother of mine would have let me eat when I was in liquor, yes, and would have swallowed it yourself to save me from my folly? I am that man, Augustus. Aye, you are that man, and one of whom all the city has been talking. They say, so poor is your taste, that you turned your back upon the favours of an empress because of some young girl you dared to love. They say also that she paid you back with a dagger in the eyes, she who was ready to set you in my place. Rumor has many tongues, Augustus, I answered. At least I fell from the Empress's favor, and she rewarded me as she held that I deserved. So it seems, Christ, what a dreadful pit is that! Is this another of her gifts? Nay, answer not, I heard the tale. Well, Olaf, you saved my life, and your Northmen have set me on the throne, since without them we could scarcely have won the palace. Now, what payment would you have? Leave to go hence, Augustus, I answered. A small boon that you might have taken without asking. If you can find a dog to lead you, like other blind wretches, 
and you captain jode and your men what do you ask such donation as it may please the augustus to bestow and after that permission to follow wherever our general olaf goes since he is our care here we have made so many enemies that we cannot sleep at night the empress of the world falls from her throne mused constantine and not even a waiting maid attends her to her prison but a blinded captain finds a regiment to escort him hence in love and honour as though he were a new crowned king truly fortune is a jester if ever fate should rob me of my eyes i wonder when i had nothing more to give them if three hundred faithful swords would follow me to ruin and to exile thus he thought aloud afterwards he jode and some others martina among them went aside leaving me seated on a bench presently they returned and constantine said general olaf i and your companions have taken counsel listen but to-day messengers have come from lesbos whom we met outside the gate it seems that the governor there is dead and that the accursed moslems threaten to storm the isle as soon as the summer comes and add it to their empire our christian subjects there pray that a new governor may be appointed one who knows war and that with him may be sent troops sufficient to repel the prophet worshippers who not having many ships cannot attack in great force now captain jode thinks this task will be to the liking of the northmen and though you are blind i think that you would serve me well as governor of lesbos is it your pleasure to accept this office ay with thankfulness augustus i answered only after the moslems are beaten back if it pleases god that it should so befall i ask leave of absence for a while since there is one for whom i must search i grant it who name captain jode your deputy stay there is one more thing in lesbos my mother has large vineyards and estates as part payment of her debt these shall be conveyed to you nay no thanks it is i who owe them whatever his faults constantine is not ungrateful moreover enough time has been spent upon this matter what say you officer that the armenians are marshalled and that you have storatius safe good i come to lead them then to the hippodrome to be proclaimed end of chapter ten end of book two book three chapter one of the wanderer's necklace by h rider haggard this librivox recording is in the public domain book three egypt chapter one tidings from egypt that curtain of oblivion without rent or seam sinks again upon the visions of this past of mine it falls as it were on the last of the scenes in the dreadful chamber of the pit to rise once more far from byzantium i am blind and can see nothing for the power which enables me to disinter what lies buried beneath the weight and wreck of so many ages tells me no more than those things that once my senses knew what i did not hear then i do not hear now what i did not see then i do not see now thus it comes about that of lesbos itself of the shape of its mountains or the colour of its seas i can tell nothing more than i was told because my sight never dwelt on them in any life that i can remember it was evening the heat of the sun had passed and the night breeze blew through the wide cool chamber in which i sat with martina whom the soldiers in their rude fashion called olaf's brown dog for brown was her colouring and she led me from place to place as dogs are trained to lead blind men yet against her the roughest of them never said an evil word not from fear but because they knew that none could be said martina was talking she who always loved to talk if not of one thing then of another 
godson she said although you are a great grumbler i tell you that in my judgment you were born under a lucky star or saint call it what you will for instance when you were walking up and down that hall of the pit in the palace at constantinople which i always dream of now if i sup too late and your spirit or double or whatever you call it was kindly leading me around the edge of the death trap i interrupted and my spirit or double making itself useful for once was doing what you say well who would have thought that before so very long you would be the governor much beloved of the rich and prosperous island of lesbos still the commander much beloved of troops many of them your own countrymen and although you are blind the imperial general who has dealt with the moslems one of the worst defeats they have suffered for a long while jode and the others did that i answered i only sat here and made the plans jode she exclaimed with contempt jode has no more head for plans than a doorpost although it is true she added with a softening of the voice that he is a good man to lean on at a pinch and a very terrible fighter also one who can keep such a brain as god gave him cool in the hour of terror as irene knows well enough yet it was you olaf not even i but you who remembered that the northmen are sea-folk born and turned all those trading vessels into war galleys and hid them in the little bays with a few of your people in command of each it was you who suffered the moslem fleet to sail unmolested into the matilian harbours pretending and giving notice that the only defence would be by land then after they were at anchor and beginning to disembark it was you who fell on them at the dawn and sank and slew till none remained save those of their army who were taken prisoners or spared for ransom yes and you commanded our ships in person and at night who is a better captain than a blind man oh you did well very well and you are rich with irene's lands and sit here in comfort and in honour with the best of health save for your blindness and i repeat that you were born under a lucky star or saint not altogether so martina i answered with a sigh ah she replied man can never be content as usual you are thinking of that egyptian i mean of the lady heliodore of whom of course it is quite right that you should think well it is true that we have heard nothing of her still that does not mean that we may not hear perhaps jode has learned something from those prisoners hark here he comes as she spoke i heard the guard salute without and jode's heavy step at the door of the chamber greeting general he said presently i bring you good news the messengers to the sultan harun have returned with the ransom also this caliph sends a writing signed by himself and his ministers in which he swears by god and his prophet that in consideration of our giving up our prisoners among whom it seems are some great men neither he nor his successors will attempt any new attack upon lesbos for thirty years the interpreter will read it to you to-morrow and you can send your answering letters with the prisoners seeing that these heathen are so many and we are so few we could scarcely look for better terms i said as i hope they will think at constantinople at least the prisoners shall sail when all is in order now for another matter have you inquired as to the bishop barnabas and the egyptian prince magus and his daughter ay general this very day i found that among the prisoners were three of the common sort who have served in egypt and left that land not three months ago of these men two have never heard of the bishop or the others the third however who was wounded in the fight had some tidings what tidings jode none that are good general the bishop he says was killed by moslems a while ago or so he had been told god rest him but the others jode what of the others this it seems that the copt as he called him magus returned from a long journey as we know he did and raised an insurrection somewhere in the south of egypt far up the nile an expedition was sent against him under one musa the governor of egypt and there was much fighting in which this prisoner took part the end of it was that the copts who fought with magus were conquered with slaughter 
Magus himself was slain, for he would not fly, and his daughter, the Lady Heliodor, was taken prisoner with some other Coptic women. And then, I gasped, then, General, she was brought before the Emir Musa, who, noting her beauty, proposed to make her his slave. At her prayer, however, being, as the prisoner said, a merciful man, he gave her a week to mourn her father before she entered his harem. Still the worst, he went on hurriedly, did not happen. Before that week was done, as the Moslem force was marching down the Nile, she stabbed the eunuch who was in charge of her and escaped. I thank God, I said, but, Jode, how is the man sure that she was Heliodore? Thus, all knew her to be the daughter of Magus, one whom the Egyptians held in honor. Moreover, among the Muslim soldiers, she was named the Lady of the Shells, because of a certain necklace she wore, which you remember. What more? I asked. Only that the Emir Musa was very angry at her loss, and because of it caused certain soldiers to be beaten on the feet. Moreover, he halted his army and offered a reward for her. For two days they hunted, even searched some tombs where it was thought she might have hidden, but there found nothing but the dead. Then the emir returned down the Nile, and that is the end of the story. Send this prisoner to me at once, Jode, with an interpreter. I would question him myself. I fear he is not fit to come, General. Then I will go to him. Lead me, Martina. If so, you must go far, General for he died an hour ago, and his companions are making him ready for burial. Jode, I said angrily, those men have been in our hands for weeks. How comes it that you did not discover these things before? You had my orders. Because, General, until they knew that they were to go free, none of these prisoners would tell us anything. However closely they were questioned, they said that it was against their oath and that first they would die. A long while ago I asked this very man of Egypt, and he vowed that he had never been there. Be comforted, Olaf, broke in Martina, for what more could he have told you? Nothing, I answered, yet I should have gained many days of time. Know that I go to Egypt to search for Heliodor. Be comforted again, said Martina. This you could not have done until the peace was signed, it would have been against your oath and duty. That is so, I answered heavily. Olaf, said Martina to me that night after Jode had left us, you say that you will go to Egypt. How will you go? Will the blind Christian general of the empire, who has just dealt so great a defeat to the mighty caliph of the east, be welcome in Egypt? Above all, will he be welcomed by the emir Musa, who rules there? when it is known that he comes to seek a woman who has escaped from that emir's harem. Why, within an hour he'd offer you the choice between death and the Koran. Olaf, this thing is madness. It may be, Martina. Still, I go to seek Heliodor. If Heliodor still lives, you will not help her by dying. And if she is dead, time will be little to her, and she can wait for you a while. Yet I go, Martina. You, being blind, go to Egypt to seek one whom those who rule there have searched for in vain? So be it. But how will you go? It cannot be as an open enemy, since then you would need a fleet and ten thousand swords to back you, which you have not. To take a few brave men, unless they were Muslims, which is impossible, would be but to give them to death. How do you go, Olaf? I do not know, Martina. Your brain is more nimble than mine. Think, think, and tell me. I heard Martina rise and walk up and down the room for a long time. At length she returned and sat herself by me again. Olaf, she said, you always had a taste for music. You have told me that as a boy in your northern home you used to play upon the harp and sing songs to it of your own making. And now, since you have been blind, you have practiced at this art till you are its master. Also, my voice is good. Indeed, it is my only gift. 
it was my voice that first brought me to irene's notice when i was there but the daughter of a poor greek gentleman who had been her father's friend and therefore was given a small place about the court of late we have sung many songs together have we not certain of them in that northern tongue of which you have taught me something yes martina but what of it you are dull olaf i have heard that these easterns love music especially if it be of a sort they do not know why therefore should not a blind man and his daughter no his orphaned niece earn an honest living as travelling musicians in egypt these prophet worshippers i am told think it a great sin to harm one who is maimed a poor northern trader in amber who has been robbed by christian thieves rendered sightless also that he might not be able to swear to them before the judges and now with his sister's child winning his bread as best he may like you olaf i have skill in languages and even know enough of arabic to beg in it for my mother who was syrian taught it to me as a child and since we have been here i've practised what say you i say that we might travel as safely thus as in any other way yet martina how can i ask you to tie such a burden on your back oh no need to ask olaf since fate bound it there when it made me your godmother where you go i needs must also go until you are married she added with a laugh afterwards perhaps you will need me no more well there's a plan for what it is worth and now we'll sleep on it hoping to find a better pray to saint michael to-night olaf as it chanced saint michael gave me no light so the end of it was that i determined to play this part of a blind harper in those days there was a trade between lesbos and egypt in cedar wood wool wine for the copts for the moslems drank none and other goods peace having been declared between the island and the caliph a small vessel was laden with such merchandise at my cost and a greek of lesbos manas by name put in command of it as the owner with a crew of sailors whom i could trust to the death to these men who were christians i told my business swearing them to secrecy by the most holy of all oaths but alas as i shall show although i could trust these sailors when they were masters of themselves i could not trust them or rather one of them when wine was his master in our northern land we had a saying that ale is another man and now its truth was to be proved to me not for the first time when all was ready i made known my plans to jode alone in whose hands i left a writing to say what must be done if i return no more to the other officers and the soldiers i said only that i proposed to make a journey in this trading ship disguised as a merchant both for my health's sake and to discover for myself the state of the surrounding countries and especially of the christians in egypt when he had heard all jode although he was a hopeful-minded man grew sad over this journey which i could see he thought would be my last i expected no less he said and yet general i trusted that your saint might keep your feet on some safer path doubtless this lady heliodore is dead or fled or wed at least you will never find her still i must search for her jode you are a blind man how can you search then an idea came to him and he added listen general i and the rest of us swore to protect the lady heliodore and to be as her father or her brothers do you bide here i will go search for her either with a vessel full of armed men or alone and disguised now i laughed outright and asked what disguise is there that would hide the giant jode whose fame the moslem spies have spread throughout the east why on the darkest night your voice would betray you to all within a hundred paces and what use would one shipload of armed men be against the forces of the emir of egypt no no jode whatever the danger i must go and i alone if i am killed or do not return within eight months i have named you to be governor of lesbos as already you have been named my deputy by constantine which appointment will probably be confirmed i do not want to be governor of lesbos said jode moreover olaf he added slowly 
A blind beggar must have his dog to lead him, his brown dog. You cannot go alone, Olaf. Those dangers of which you speak must be shared by another. That is so, and it troubles me much. Indeed, it is in my mind to seek some other guide, for I think this one would be safest here in your charge. You must reason with her, Jode. One can ask too much, even of a godmother. Of a godmother? Why not say of a grandmother by Thor? Olaf, you are blind indeed. Still, I'll try. Hush. Here she comes to say that our supper is ready. At our meal, several others were present, besides the serving folk, and the talk was general. After it was done, I had an interview with some officers. These left, and I sat myself down upon a cushioned couch, and being tired there fell asleep, till I was awakened, or rather half awakened by voices talking in the garden without. They were those of Jode and Martina, and Martina was saying, Cease your words. I and no one else will go on this Egyptian quest with Olaf. If we die, as I dare say we shall, what does it matter? At least he shall not die alone. And if the quest should fail, Martina? I mean, if he should not find the Lady Heliodore, and you should happen both to return safe, what then? Why, then nothing, except that as it has been, so it will be. I shall continue to play my part, as is my duty and my wish. Do you not remember that I am Olaf's godmother? Yes, I remember. Still, I have heard somewhere that the Christian church never ties a knot which it cannot unnoose for a proper fee. And for my part, I do not know why a man should not marry one of different blood because she has been named his godmother before a stone vessel by a man in a broidered robe. You say I do not understand such matters. Perhaps. So let them be. But, Martina, let us suppose that this strange search were to succeed, and Olaf has a way of succeeding where others would fail. For instance, who else could have escaped alive out of the hand of Irene and become governor of Lesbos, and, being blind, yet have planned a great victory? Well, supposing that by the help of gods or men or women he should find this beautiful Heliodore unwed and still willing and that they should marry what then martina then captain jode she answered slowly if you are yet of the same mind we may talk again only remember that i ask no promises and make none so you go to egypt with olaf ay certainly unless i should die first and perhaps even then you do not understand Oh, of course you do not understand, nor can I stop to explain to you. Captain Jode, I am going to Egypt with a certain blind beggar whose name I forget at the moment. But who is my uncle, where no doubt I shall see many strange things? If I ever come back, I will tell you about them. And meanwhile, good night. End of chapter 1 Book Three, Chapter Two of the Wanderer's Necklace by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, The Statues by the Nile. The first thing that I remember of this journey to Egypt is that I was sitting in the warm morning sunshine on the deck of our little trading vessel that went by the name of the heathen goddess Diana. We were in the port of Alexandria. Martina, who now went by the name of Hilda, stood by my side describing to me the great city that lay before us. She told me of the famous pharaohs still rising from its rock, although in it the warning light no longer burned, for since the Muslims took Egypt they had let it die, as some said because they feared lest it should guide a Christian fleet to attack them. She described also the splendid palaces that the Greeks had built, many of them now empty or burned out. The Christian churches, the mosques, the broad streets, and the grass-grown quays. As we were thus engaged, she talking and I listening and asking questions, she said, The boat is coming with the Sarsian officers of the port, 
who must inspect and pass the ship before she is allowed to discharge her cargo now olaf remember that henceforth you are called hodur i had taken this name after that of the blind god of the northern peoples play your part well and above all be humble if you are reviled or even struck show no anger and be sure to keep that red sword of yours close hidden beneath your robe if you do these things we shall be safe for i tell you that we are well disguised the boat came alongside and i heard men climbing the ship's ladder then someone kicked me it was our captain menas who also had his part to play out of the road you blind beggar he said the noble officers of the caliph board our ship and you block their path touch not one whom god has afflicted said a grave voice speaking in bad greek it is easy for us to walk round the man but who is he captain and why does he come to egypt by their looks he and the woman with him might well have seen happier days i know not lord answered the captain who after they paid their passage money took no more note of them still they play and sing well and served to keep the sailors in good humour when we were becalmed sir i broke in i am a northman named hoder and this woman is my niece i was a trader in amber but thieves robbed me and my companions of all we had as we journeyed to byzantium me who was the leader of our band they held to ransom blinding me lest i should be able to swear to them again but the others they killed this is the only child of my sister who married a greek and now we get our living by our skill in music truly you christians love each other well said the officer accept the koran and you will not be treated thus but why do you come to egypt sir we heard that it is a rich land where the people love music and have come hoping to earn some money here that we may put by to live on send us not away sir we have a little offering to make niece hilda where is the gold piece i gave you offer it to this lord nay nay said the officer shall i take bread out of the mouth of the poor clerk he added in arabic to a man who was with him make out a writing giving leave to these two to land and to ply their business anywhere in egypt without question or hindrance and bring it to me to seal farewell musicians i fear you will find money scarce in egypt for the land has been stricken with a famine yet go and prosper in the name of god and may he turn your hearts to the true faith thus it came about that through the good mind of this moslem whose name as i learned when we met again was yusuf our feet were lifted over many stumbling blocks thus it seemed that by virtue of his office he had power to prevent the entry into the land of such folk as we seemed to be which power if they were christians was almost always put in force yet because he had seen the captain appear to ill-treat me or because being a soldier himself he guessed that i was of the same trade whatever tale it might please me to tell this rule was not enforced moreover the writing which he gave me enabled me to go where we wished in egypt without let or hindrance whenever we were stopped or threatened which happened to us several times it was enough if we presented it to the nearest person in authority who could read after which we were allowed to pass upon our way unhindered before we left the ship i had a last conversation with the captain menace telling him that he was to lie in the, the harbour always pretending that he had waited for some cargo not yet forthcoming such as unharvested corn or whatever was convenient until we appeared again if after a certain while we did not appear then he was to make a trading journey to neighbouring ports and return to alexandria these artifices he must continue to practise until orders to the contrary reached him under my own hand or until he had sure evidence that we were dead all this the man promised that he would do yes said martina who was with me you promise captain and we believe you but the question is can you answer for the others 
for instance for the sailor cosmas there who i see is already drunken and talking loudly about many things henceforth lady cosmas shall drink water only when not in his cups he is an honest fellow and i do answer for him yet alas as the end showed cosmas was not to be answered for by any one we went ashore and took up our abode in a certain house where we were safe whether the christian owners of that house did or did not know who we were i am not certain at any rate through them we were introduced at night into the palace of politian the malachite patriarch of alexandria he was a stern-faced black-bearded man of honest heart but narrow views of whom the bishop barnabas had often spoken to me as his closest friend to this politian i told all under the seal of our faith asking his aid in my quest when i had finished my tale he thought a while then said you are a bold man general olaf so bold that i think god must be leading you to his own ends now you have heard aright barnabas my beloved brother and your father in christ has been taken hence he was murdered by some fanatic Moslems soon after his return from Byzantium. Also, it is true that the Prince Magus was killed in war by the Emir Musa, and that the Lady Heliodor escaped out of his clutches. What became of her afterwards, no man knows, but for my part, I believe that she is dead. And I believe that she is alive, I answered, and therefore I go to seek her seek and ye shall find mused the patriarch at least i hope so though my advice to you is to bide here and send others to seek that i will not do i answered again then go and god be with you i'll warn certain of the faith of your coming so that you may not lack a friend at need when you return if you should ever return come to me for I have more influence with these Muslims than most, and may be able to serve you. I can say no more, and it is not safe that you should tarry here too long. Stay, I forget, there are two things you should know. The first is that the emir Musa, he who seized the lady Heliodor, is about to be deposed. I have the news from the Caliph Harun himself, for with him I am on friendly terms, because of a service I did him through my skill in medicine. The second is that Irene has beguiled Constantine, or bewitched him, I know not which. At least by his own proclamation, once more she rules the empire jointly with himself, and that, I think, will be his death warrant, and perhaps yours also. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, I said, now if i live i shall learn whether any oaths are sacred to irene as will constantine then we parted leaving alexandria we wandered first to the town of misra which stood near to the mighty pyramids beneath whose shadow we slept one night in an empty tomb thence by slow marches we made our way up the banks of the nile earning our daily bread by the exercise of our art once or twice we were stopped as spies but always released again when I produced the writing that the officer Yusuf had given me upon the ship. For the rest, none molested us in a land where wandering beggars were so common. Of money, it is true, we earned little, but as we had gold in plenty sewn into our garments, this did not matter. Food was all we needed, and that, as I have said, was never lacking. So we went on our strange journey day by day learning more of the tongues spoken in egypt and especially of arabic which the moslems used whither did we journey we know not for certain what i sought to find were those two huge statues of which i had dreamed at ar on the night of the robbing of the wanderer's tomb we heard that there were such figures of stone which were said to sing at daybreak and that they sat upon a plain on the western bank of the nile near to the ruins of the great city of thebes now but a village called by the arabs el uxor or the palaces so far as we could discover it was in the neighbourhood of this city that heliodor had escaped from musa and there if anywhere i hoped to gain tiding of her fate 
also something within my heart drew me to those images of forgotten gods or men at length two months or more after we left alexandria from the deck of the boat in which we had hired a passage for the last hundred miles of our journey martina saw to the east of the ruins of thebes to the west she saw other ruins and seated in front of them two mighty figures of stone this is the place she said and my heart leapt at her words now let us land and follow our fortune so when the boat was tied up at sunset to the west bank of the river as it happened we bade farewell to the owner and went ashore whither now asked martina to the figures of stone i answered so she led me through fields in which the corn was growing to the edge of the desert meeting no man all the way then for a mile or more we tramped through the sand till at length late at night martina halted we stand beneath the statues she said and they are awesome to look on mighty seated kings higher than a tall tree what lies behind them i asked the ruins of a great temple lead me to that temple so we passed through a gateway into a court and there we halted now tell me what you see i said we stand in what has been a hall of many columns she answered but the most of them are broken at our feet is a pool in which there is a little water before us lies the plain on which the statues sit stretching some miles to the nile that is fringed with palms across the broad nile are the ruins of old thebes behind us are more ruins and a line of rugged hills of stone and in them a little to the north to the mouth of a valley the scene is very beautiful beneath the moon but very sad and desolate it is the place that i saw in my dream many years ago at r i said it may be she answered but if so it must have changed since save for a jackal creeping among the columns and a dog that barks in some distant village i neither see nor hear a living thing what now olaf now we will eat and sleep i said perhaps light will come to us in our sleep so we ate some of the food we had brought with us and afterwards lay down to rest in a little chamber painted round with gods that martina found in the ruins of the temple during that night no dreams came to me nor did anything happen to disturb us even in this old temple of which the very paving stones were worn through by the feet of the dead before the dawn martina led me back to the colossal statues and we waited there hoping that we should hear them sing as tradition said they did when the sun rose yet the sun came up as it had done from the beginning of the world and struck upon those giant effigies as it had done for some two thousand years or so i was told and they remained quite silent i do not think that ever i grieved more over my blindness than on this day when i must depend on martina to tell me of the glory of that sunrise over the egyptian desert and those mighty ruins reared by the hands of forgotten men well the sun rose and since the statues would not speak i took my harp and played upon it and martina sang a wild eastern song to my playing it seemed that our music was heard at any rate a few folk going out to labor came to see by whom it was caused and finding only two wandering musicians presently went away again still one remained a woman coptic by her dress with whom i had heard martina talk she asked who we were and why we had come to such a place whereon martina repeated to her the story which we had told a hundred times the woman answered that we should earn little money in those parts as the famine had been sore there owing to the low nile of the previous season until the crops were ripe again which in the case of most of them would not be for some weeks even food she added must be scarce though few were left to eat it since the moslems had killed out most of those who dwelt in that district of upper egypt martina replied that she knew this was so and therefore we had proposed either to travel on to nubia or to return north still as i her blind uncle was not well 
we had landed from a boat hoping that we might find some place where we could rest for a week or two until i grew stronger yet she continued meaningly being poor christian folk we know not where to look for such a place since cross worshippers are not welcome among those who follow the prophet now when the woman heard that we were christians her voice changed i also am a christian she said but give me the sign so we made the sign of the cross on our breasts which a muslim will die rather than do my husband and i went on the woman live yonder at the village of kurna which is situated near to the mouth of the valley that is called biban el miluk or gate of the kings for there the monarchs of old days who were the forefathers or rulers of us copts lie buried it is but a very small village for the moslems have killed most of us in a war that was raised a while ago between them and our hereditary prince magas yet my husband and i have a good house there and being poor shall be glad to give you food and shelter if you can pay us something the end of it was that after some chaffering for we dared not show that we had much money a bargain was struck between us and this good woman who was named palka having paid her a week's charges in advance she led us to the village of kurna which was nearly an hour's walk away and here made us known to her husband a middle-aged man named marcus who took little note of anything save his farming this he carried on upon a patch of fertile ground that was irrigated by a spring which flowed from the mountains also he had other lands near to the nile where he grew corn and fodder for his beasts in his house that once had been part of some great stone building of the ancients and still remained far larger than he could use for this pair had no children we were given two good rooms here we dwelt in comfort since notwithstanding the scarcity of the times marcus was richer than he seemed and lived well as for the village of kurna its people all told did not amount to more than thirty souls christians every one of them who were visited from time to time by a coptic priest from some distant monastery in the mountains by degrees we grew friendly with palka a pleasant bustling woman of good birth who loved to hear of the outside world moreover she was very shrewd and soon began to suspect that we were more than mere wandering players pretending to be weak and ill i did not go out much but followed her about the house while she was working talking to her on many matters thus i led up to the subject of prince magus and his rebellion and learned that he had been killed at a place about fifty miles south from kurna then i asked if it were true that his daughter had been killed with him what do you know of the lady heliodore she asked sharply only that my niece who for a while was a servant in the palace at byzantium before she was driven away with the others after the empress fell saw her there indeed it was her business to wait upon her and her father the prince therefore she is interested in her fate it seems that you are more interested than your niece who has never spoken a word to me concerning her answered polka well since you are a man i should not have thought this strange had you not been blind for they say she was the most beautiful woman in egypt as for her fate you must ask god since none now know it when the army of musa was encamped yonder by the nile my husband marcus who had taken two donkey loads of forage for sale to the camp and was returning by moonlight saw her run past him a red knife in her hand her face set towards the gateway of the kings after that he saw her no more nor did any one else although they hunted long enough even in the tombs which the moslems like our people fear to visit doubtless she fell or threw herself into some hole in the rocks or perhaps the wild beasts ate her better so than that a child of the old pharaohs should become the woman of an infidel yes i answered better so but why do folk fear to visit those tombs of which you speak palka why because they are haunted that is all and even the bravest dread the sight of a ghost how could they be otherwise than haunted seeing that yonder valley is sown with the mighty dead like a field with corn yet the dead sleep quietly enough palka i the common dead holder but not these kings and queens and princes 
who being gods of a kind cannot die it is said that they hold their revels yonder at night with songs and wild laughter and that those who look upon them come to an evil end within a year whether this be so i cannot say since for many years none have dared to visit that place at night yet that they eat i know well enough how do you know palka for a good reason with the others in this village i supply the offerings of their food the story runs that once the great buildings of which this house is a part was a college of heathen priests whose duty it was to make offerings to the dead in the royal tombs when the christians came those priests were driven away but we of kurna who live in their house still make the offerings if we did not misfortune would overtake us as indeed has always happened if they were forgotten or neglected it is the rent that we pay to the ghosts of the kings twice a week we pay it setting food and milk and water upon a certain stone near to the mouth of the valley then what happens palka nothing except that the offering is taken by beggar folk or perchance by wild creatures would beggar folk dare to enter that place of death she answered with contempt or would wild beasts take the food and pile the dishes neatly together and replace the flat stones on the mouths of the jars of milk and water as a housewife might oh do not laugh of late this has always been done as i who often fetch the vessels know well have you ever seen these ghosts palka yes once i saw one of them it was about two months ago that i passed the mouth of the valley after moonrise for i had been kept out late searching for a kid which was lost thinking that it might be in the valley i peered up it as i was looking from round a great rock glided a ghost she stood still with the moonlight shining on her and gazed towards the nile i too stood still in the shadow thirty or forty paces away then she threw up her arms as though in despair turned and vanished she i said then checked myself and asked indifferently well what was the fashion of this ghost so far as i could see that of a young and beautiful woman wearing such clothes as we find upon the ancient dead only wrapped more loosely about her had she aught upon her head palka yes a band of gold or a crown set upon her hair and about her neck what seemed to be a necklace of green and gold for the moonlight flashed upon it it was much such a necklace as you wear beneath your robe hodur and pray how do you know what i wear palka i asked by means of what you lack poor man the eyes in my head one night when you were asleep i had need to pass through your chamber to reach another beyond you had thrown off your outer garment because of the heat and i saw the necklace also i saw a great red sword lying by your side and noted on your bare breast sundry scars such as hunters and soldiers come by all of these things hoder i thought strange seeing that i know you to be nothing but a poor blind beggar who gains his bread by his skill upon the harp there are beggars who were not always beggars palka i said slowly quite so hoder and there are great men and rich who sometimes appear to be beggars and many other things still have no fear that we shall steal your necklace or talk about the red sword or the gold with which your niece hilda weighs her garments poor girl she has all the ways of a fine lady one who has known courts as i think you said was the case it must be sad for her to have fallen so low still have no fear hoder and she took my hand and pressed it in a certain secret fashion which was practised among the persecuted christians in the east when they would reveal themselves to each other then she went away laughing as for me i sought martina who had been sleeping through the heat and told her everything well she said when i had finished you should give thanks to god olaf since without doubt this ghost is the lady heliodore so should jode i heard her add beneath her breath for in my blindness my ears had grown very quick end of chapter two